So Laura asked me to talk about something that I was excited about with regards to what we're doing with AI for weather and climate. And I told her that one of the things that we were excited about that we're working on lately is working using, trying to figure out how we can do better at facilitating um, ethical and responsible AI for weather and climate. And so that is what I'm going to talk about. So I already got introduced. I am um, a professor in the School of Computer Science and School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm a director of the NSF AI Institute that I'm about to talk about some of the work of. So this is joint work um, with three of my colleagues from the NSF Institute, Emma Ebert Uboff, Ann Bostrom, and John, David John Gagne. So the, what I want to talk about for the ethical and responsible AI is part of what we're doing for our NSF AI Institute. Again, we are doing many things with our NSF AI Institute, and I decided not to make this talk an overview of that. Again, I'm only going to talk about the ethical and responsible AI. So this is my one slide overview of the fact that we have this NSF AI Institute and what we're doing. Our focus is on developing and understanding what it means to be trustworthy AI with applications to weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. Um, we, we have the goal of unique developing um, benefiting humanity by developing novel, physically based, which means based in the laws of physics, AI techniques that are demonstrated to be trustworthy, which means we're working on figuring out what it means to be trustworthy and what we need to do when we understand what trustworthy is and how we feed that back into the AI methods. That with the goal of all of those to improve prediction and understanding and communication of high impact environmental hazards. And this, as I said, is my only slide overview of the, the Institute. The rest of it we're going to talk about um, ethical and responsible AI. But all of the partners of the Institute are listed on the slide, and um, you can learn more on our web page as well. So, you know, as we were, this was not, the, the, the proposal for ethical AI was not part of our Institute proposal, but as we were working on our research in our first year, we're realizing that we're the Institute for Trustworthy AI in weather, climate, and coastal oceanography, and there's a specific meaning to the word trustworthy, and if we're not addressing the use of responsible and ethical use of AI in the environmental community, then, then we're figuring who's going to. Like we, the, the words trustworthy AI mean that we should be considering this part of our mission. And so we are adopting it as part of what we are doing. Um, and it's a moment we borrowed this quote from Yeb Sanyo of, if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? This is really something that's very new. The ethical and responsible use of AI is growing in the AI community as a whole, but in the community of using it for weather and climate, it's very much new. As far as I can tell, the only people who are talking about it right now are the people who you saw pictures of in the first uh, couple of slides ago. It's the group of us who are working on it. We're also working on a paper, which you will be seeing, let's call it soon. If life would stop follow, throwing me curveballs this week, it would be nice. It's been a long week. Um, but this quote, um, just to sort of put the urgency, especially in a week when this is also COP26 week, um, you know, this quote of, if not us, then who and if not now then when actually comes from a 2012 UN climate summit in Doha um, and, and from Yeb Sanyo and if you have not seen this video quote it is a very moving clip and it's even more moving to realize that it was from 2012 and we are still not doing enough about it why why and what can we do with AI that's going to help us I don't know that I'm going to, to solve that I'm going to talk about some ways that we can hopefully make AI not go so wrong um, but before I get there you know, talking about the words environmental justice, environmental justice is a concept that's been around for a while, um, but we haven't typically talked about how AI can help with environmental justice. And so I have a couple of slides to talk about that first. You know, climate change is adversely affecting disadvantaged communities. Um, the weather extremes that are happening, the heat, the flooding, the fires, I grabbed this from a picture of one of the wildfires this summer. Um, all of those are affect, they affect everyone, but they're affecting the disadvantaged communities even more so. If we can improve our prediction of them, then we can improve our resiliency. We're not going to be able to stop pretty much any of those weather extremes we talked about, the heat, the flooding, the fires, the drought. Okay, we can talk about stopping on a grander scale at the COP26 level of scale of like trying to stop down or stop our global warming. But I'm talking about stop the event. The tornado is coming at you. We're not going to stop it. We're not doing weather control. But if we can improve the prediction, then we can improve resiliency and we can improve it for everybody, including the disadvantaged communities. And we can also use the AI to simulate sensors in places where there's perhaps less sensors. The United States is blessed to be pretty sensor rich. Um, and if we can find ways to simulate the sensors in places that have less sensors, then we can improve predictions in some traditionally underserved places. We can also help with sustainability. We can improve efficiency for wind and solar farms. 
Um, we could protect them from, you know, if you can shut down the solar or the wind farm before you have a severe wind come event, you can keep the solar or not the solar farm, the wind farm from being damaged. Um, you can you can protect uh, solar farms from from hail events if you know they're coming. All of these things, you know, we can't stop the hailstorm, but we can improve the, the resiliency. Um, we could also talk about climate migration. It's something I haven't seen too many people talk about with AI, but AI climate projections could assist with climate migration and assist with resiliency and assist with choosing locations for new green energy projects too. All of these things are ways in which AI could do really, really well. AI can also go horribly wrong. And this is where we don't see a whole lot of people talking about it, particularly in the weather and climate community. Um, this is a picture from something that went pretty viral last year, where the picture on the left is a picture of President Obama at a downsampled image, and it's sent into a network that when it comes back out at the upsampled, you know, supposed to be a high resolution version, it comes out as a white guy. It's not Obama on the right. There are other pictures, if you go to that article, um, every single person that the author sent through this network, Hispanic, Black, Asian, all of them come out white. You might think, okay, what are we doing? You know, what does this have to do with weather? We don't have black and white in weather. We don't have race in weather. But as it turns out, I'm gonna talk about some of the ways in which we do. So um, AI is used throughout society in a variety of ways right now. And we don't talk enough about the ways in which it can go wrong, even outside of weather and climate. But we need to be really, really careful that what we're doing is not perpetuating environmental injustice issues by perpetuating a bias. So in this particular case, the issue is that the data set was trained entirely on white people. And so the data that comes in is what goes back out. And if it didn't ever see a black person, it's just gonna put a white person back out because it never saw any black people. If we can be doing similar things to our weather and our climate data, we can be perpetuating injustice issues. And so let's talk about that. You might be thinking, how can that possibly happen? So I have a list. The list that's in bold are the parts I'm going to talk about. The list that is not in bold, I wasn't going to talk about, although I'm glad to answer questions on it. I'm also glad to answer questions throughout. As I said, I'm happy to be interrupted. How could AI go wrong in weather and climate? We're going to talk about the way the model training choices could go wrong, the way the training data can go wrong, the way the labels could be wrong, adversaries that can happen, and faulty strategies that could happen. And then the ones I didn't, I just don't have time to talk about. Um, they can learn to fake something plausible like GANs. They could be used inappropriately. They could be non-trustworthy. And I would welcome more ideas. So let's start with the model training choices. Um, and you will notice that I grabbed a few XKCD cartoons because I just find XKCD to illustrate so, so well. And in this case, let's start with the model training choices. Our field has been struggling with this problem for years. Struggle no more. I'm here to solve it with algorithms. Six months later, wow, this problem's really hard. And the scientists, well, you don't say. If we don't put the AI and the domain scientists working together well, we are going to re-illustrate this problem only potentially with biases and other things happen. The domain scientists know what they're doing. They know what's hard. They know exactly what's in the data. They know potentially what the data has biases in it, where data might be wrong and what they need to correct for. The AI scientists, if they're not working collaboratively, can come in and say, ah, this algorithm will solve this problem. But then they look like this because they may not in fact choose the right thing, the right data set, any of these other things correctly. So they may unintentionally do something that could just recreate biases. So they're going to choose the best model when they fully understand the problem and when they're working collaboratively. And it can go very, very wrong outside of an XKCD cartoon when you do it wrong. So let's talk about some of the ways in which that data could be biased. Um, we So in rare events, we have, a clear bias, the data is non-representative. So I grabbed a couple of pictures of two things that are really rare events. Tornadoes, if you are generating a machine learning predictor that is just you know, saying no tornado all the time, it's gonna do really, really well by accuracy because our tornadoes don't happen on a regular basis. However, when they do happen, they're important to get correct. Turbulence, grab this fun picture of some wake turbulence. Turbulence is another thing. If you think about the 3D volume above the earth, Turbulence is extremely rare, and yet it's extremely important to predict well. So it's examples of some rare events that just, I mean, without any adversaries or anything else, they're just rare events, and we need to be able to predict them well and to train well on them. Going to the next thing that could happen with our data outside of rare events, we just have non-uniform sensors. Um, so, for example, air pollution is more prevalent in, uh, by the sensors in the affluent areas in the countries because that's where we have the sensors. Remote mountain areas, oceans, they're not well-sensed. 
depending on what it is you're trying to do. I mean, the ocean's pretty much not covered at all, except for with satellites, and they not, not be measuring at all what you want. You want radar? Sorry, too bad, so sad. The mountains aren't covered well either. This non-uniform sensor coverage could cause biases in our models, and we'll talk about a specific example of that in a second. Another thing that could happen, you think, well, my work that I'm doing is using a sensor that's global, like satellites. Well, what if you're only using the visible light spectra? Then you're only getting you know, when you actually have light. So the phenomena are not well represented at night. I tried to find a graphic of this. It was told to me by a hurricane scientist, but I couldn't find a graphic of it. But they told me that the initiation time for hurricanes is skewed towards the early morning. And it's not because hurricanes are starting in the early morning. It's because the scientists who are labeling it as a hurricane, as opposed to a tropical storm, um, are waiting until they see the visible light imagery before they officially label it. Don't have graphics to back that up. So I just got that from, from a hurricane scientist. Um, but along with this, this, this non-representative training data, you know, the climate change is rare. It's unprecedented. It's non-uniformly sensed, all of these things. And it's altering the frequency of our extreme phenomena that were already rare, but it's altering the, the, the characteristics of the extreme phenomena as well as the frequency. And if we're learning from data that is not well re represented, we can unintentionally represent these biases in our climate models and our weather models. And this could unintentionally result in, in environmental injustice. Let me be very specific because when I give this, people nod their heads and think, yes, yes, yes. And then they think, but this doesn't apply to me. So I grabbed a, a, a data set. This is weather, not climate, but it is a data set that is very clearly showing an unintentional bias. So I want to be clear when I'm showing this picture that this is not a slam against the Weather Service. They did not do this on purpose. The graphic, which was not made by me, it was made by Jack Sillen, it's down there on the quote, you can get to the exact Twitter that he put up on this, um, was is showing where the National Radar Network is in the Southeast United States on top of a map that shows the percentage of black people in the different counties. And then the green part of the radar is where you have really good radar coverage, the yellow parts where the radar coverage is a little bit less good, so it's higher levels in the atmosphere. And then when you just are not covered by a circle, you don't have great radar coverage. What are we missing? What we're missing is that we don't have great radar coverage in the counties with the highest percentages of black people. Again, not saying that the National Weather Service did this on purpose, but we all know that there are tornadoes down there. And this means that we have an environmental injustice issue in the sense that we are not having great radar coverage for areas where there are more black people and there are tornadoes and we don't have the sensors there to do something about it. Now, how does this relate to machine learning? Well, if we're training on machine learning, the machine learning learns, let's imagine, because this is something one of my PhD students, former PhD students have worked on now and my postdoc is looking at it, is how we could train a, um, a tornado prediction algorithm from the radar data. Let's imagine we train up one that's really good. It's better than the human forecasters and we deploy it and it, it's, it's doing great and it's predicting these tornadoes fabulously, but it's only doing it where the radar coverage is good. Now we're missing a whole part of the United States. And if we deploy this worldwide, we're missing a huge part of the world because the radar coverage doesn't look, less, look like this over the world. So we're perpetuating injustice. Okay, moving to the next one. Um, thinking about ways in which the data could be biased. And I don't have a whole lot of climate-based labels. I have mostly weather-based labels, but I'm glad to talk about climate-based labels too. Um, I just didn't have a lot of pictures that I could find for it. But for example, um, Data that relies on humans to report it or label it can create unintentional biases. And we're gonna show a couple of different ways in, ways in which it creates unintentional biases. First of all, these are all the hail reports from 1955 to 2014. Put on top of a roadmap, do you notice that it hails on roads and cities? Do you think that it only hails on roads and cities or do you think that hail might be more of a uniform distribution? Pretty sure the clouds aren't coming along and going, I'm going to hail there because there's a road. So if we were learning from this data set, we might be unintentionally replicating something that we didn't mean. And just in case you think this is only hail, um, this graphic is a little bit harder to look at, but I have the reference to the paper. Um, same deal with tornadoes. It only tornadoes, apparently, where there are people and road networks. And just in case you think that that's the only problem, okay, fine, we can correct for a population bias. That's actually what this paper talks about is the way to doing a, a Bayesian correction uh, to, to deal with population bias. Okay, but now we're gonna talk about another way in which human data could be wrong. And again, this can apply to our, our weather data and our climate data. I have, again, only weather examples at the moment. Um, hail data, looking at hail data again, when hail data sizes are reported, they tend to be very discrete. Humans look at a ball of hail, an irregularly shaped ball of hail, and they say, meh, 
looks like a golf ball, looks like a baseball, looks like a softball. And one of the sizes is teacup. Who uses teacups anymore? So that one doesn't get it. We're all reported. I'm pretty sure the hail size is continuous, not discrete. But if you look at the distribution, you end up with a discrete series of bumps. So this could, again, be a problematic for your algorithm. And getting to yet one more, just to drive the point home, yet one more example of where the data is wrong from humans. They actually, in this paper, stuck humans in a wind tunnel. And they asked the humans what wind they were perceiving compared to what they were actually getting. And the answer is they were doing a terrible job of it. So the actual wind speed is on the lower axis. The x-axis here, the perceived wind speed is on the y-axis. This is not a one-to-one -one line. This is not what you want. Humans don't perceive wind speed at all well. And then you look at the reports that come in from the National Weather Service, and they're conveniently happening in five-mile-an-hour intervals. So the reports are the round, the red ones, and then the, the actual measurements that are coming from the sensors are blue. Again, a continuous distribution versus a discrete distribution. Maybe you don't think this has a big deal, but if you think about it overall and you think that it might be happening in data that you didn't think about it happening in, it could really affect your training and it could, it could mess with what your machine learning models are doing. So it's something that we just need to be aware of to look for in our data sets and correct for before we go use our data sets. Now I'm gonna to jump to adversaries because I said there was a list of things that I want to talk about. So um, you might think, well, there's no adversaries in weather. And that's typically what will happen. People will be like, oh, weather, weather doesn't have adversaries. You know, when you talk about a computer science, talking about robustness and trying to make your data learn and your machine learning models work robustly. And they talk about, you know, an adversary that comes in and puts like a little piece of tape on your stop sign and makes it not look like a stop sign or a little piece of tape on your, your speed limit sign and make it look from 35 to 85. Those are true adversaries, but it turns out they affect, they exist in weather too. And there are two ways that we can see the adversaries in the weather data. So the first is the humans still exist. The human, if you're collecting any data that's crowdsourced, it can be hacked or deliberately falsified. So I have an example on the right-hand side of something from a data set that's called MPing. Um, and MPing is a crowdsourced data set where anybody can download it on their phone. It's free and you can report wind and hail and tornadoes and the size of your hail and you know all these other different weather data sets. Somebody hacked it one day and decided that they were gonna draw graphics. I grabbed a polite graphic. They drew some impolite graphics too. This kind of stuff is adversarial data. If you don't know that it exists in your data, then you're learning on data that's complete BS. And so that's very, very wrong. And if you think, oh, well, I'm just gonna throw MPing out. MPing, by the way, has fixed their bug that got hacked. But you know, there are plenty of other examples out there. Um, it, humans file insurance fraud all the time. And this insurance fraud reports might be false hail reports or false wind reports so that they can get the damage on their house fixed, right, for free. And that those reports are going to show up eventually in a storm report. And, you know, not every single one of those is verified, and they could be causing uh, issues in your machine learning, for example. And there are plenty of other examples you could come up with. And if you want to go outside of the human and just say, you know, okay, fine, I'm going to turn off my mind and the adversaries don't apply to me in, the, in the, what I'm doing. Weather provides its own adversary. So I grabbed two examples of weather providing an adversary. The first is um, on the right-hand side here. See, my cursor will show up. There we go. Right-hand side here, we have a picture from the Oklahoma Mesonet, the day that a tornado hit the El Reno Mesonet, recorded 151 mile an hour wind gust, which if you're just looking at this graphic might look like it's an anomaly. It's an extreme value. Sure, there were high winds, but 151 miles an hour looks like an anomaly. Maybe you just want to throw it out, but it turns out it was true. It was really a tornado. Shortly thereafter, however, it didn't report anything else because that's what happened to the station. It was done. This relates to the next way in which weather is an adversary. This is a picture of the power outages um, after, after a hurricane, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which hurricane this is. I just grabbed the power outage map. Um, a hurricane that hit New Orleans. <laughs> it's not Katrina. It was a relatively recent map. And when we were talking about weather biases with some of our hurricane scientists, which is where that other data set example that I was talking about earlier came in, they pointed out that there's a major bias in the hurricane sampling in the sense that once the hurricane makes landfall, all of the sensors that have been sensing things up until it makes landfall go offline because you've all lost power. And so that's why I grabbed the power outage map. Because now if you're assuming you've got ground truth and that is what your power outage looks like, you have no ground truth. So weather provides its own adversary, even if you don't want to think about the humans providing adversaries, which unfortunately they do. Um, let's go down the next one. Sometimes AI looks like it's working well, but you haven't jumped into what's going on. This is a reason we really, really, really need to dive into what we're doing, explainable and interpretable AI. I grabbed this example 
um, from some work based on Ryan Lagerquist, who was my PhD student, and Randy Chase has been digging into it. He's my postdoc. Um, so this is based on work from this paper that's published, but this is the, the example I'm about to show is not from that. It's kind of, it's an example showing really why we really need to look into what the models have learned. So we have um, looked at the best hits and we said, you know, what's going on? Are, are we really learning something about the structure of a tornado? And these slides, the next three slides all came from Randy. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we have just the 3D graphic showing um, an average probability match mean of a tornado and the the, these are on the best hits, so it's a 99% chance that a tornado is going to happen. And it looks like a nice, deep, convective storm. It's tall. This is, you know, Z height, so it's you're up to 12 kilometers. It's a deep storm. The probability match means that you can almost see the hint of a, of a hook echo, but again, they're means, so you're not going to see all the structure. But, you know, we thought, okay, this is looking really good. He wanted to see what happened if he started replacing the data with random noise or if data was just missing, like if one level was missing. And he was particularly interested in what happened if the data was missing, because as you get farther and farther from the radar, sometimes you have data that's missing, especially at the different levels. And then he also wanted to see what happened if you put in random data. You would hope that if your model had learned something very physical about the structure of the storm, which is what we all keep talking about, the physics-based machine learning, that it would learn that the tornado probability would drop off. So first looking at um, dropping off the data, it took this is number of altered layers. As he dropped off the data, the probabilities didn't go down the way that he expected them. It took him to drop off five layers before they started going down significantly. And then he started adding random noise and it hardly went down at all. He's still getting a 60% probability of tornado prediction. This, we could dive into the why this is happening, but the reason I brought this example up was not to complain about the model, but to show that if you stopped your learning back at this first XAI of making a plot and saying, all right, my model learned something really physical. You basically have done confirmation bias and you haven't gone forward enough to say, is my model really doing something physical? And, and we've dived into it much more and there's more results and we have reasons for this and I can go into them later in the questions if you really want to know. But, but the, the point of the talk was not about the tornadoes. The point of the talk was to say that if we're not looking deeply into our models and we just project them into the future and we blindly trust them, we might be getting things that we shouldn't be trusting. So what are we working on currently? I told you there's gonna be more XKCD cartoons. This one's a fabulous one. Why Asimov put the three laws of robotics in the order that he did. In the order that they are in, you have a nice balanced world. We are trying to work up a set of principles for ethical and responsible use of AI for weather and climate. We would like them to be in the balanced world order and not in the frustrating world order or um, the killbot hellscape order, which is what happens if you get them in the wrong order. There's an awful lot of ways in which we can do this wrong. We're also working to identify um, approaches to identify the bias in the weather and climate data automatically. Part of the ways that we found some of the biases that we talked about is just asking people, people who understand the data sets. Um, another one that I, again, don't have an example from, but from coming from the hurricane discussion, if you're studying the hurricanes, people outside of hurricanes perhaps think that there's ground truth in this data set called Best Track, but Best Track is known to have biases. And so if you're just recreating it, you're recreating something with biases in it. So we want to find a way to automatically try to identify biases in data while having to talk. I mean, we want to talk to the domain scientists all the time, but we would really, really like it if there was a test that you could come up with that could say, here's some biases that already exist, and now can you talk about some more? So we want to work on developing approaches to that. And then working on identifying the links between this ethical and responsible principles and the use of AI and trust in AI for both weather and climate predictions. So I have a little bit more on that. Um, this was work from, um, well, this is, this is not my work. This part of the discussion is from Ann Bostrom. Um, she gave a talk at our um, summer school this summer about looking at ways we could develop principles of XAI, uh, for, or ethical XAI specifically from moral philosophy. Um, and I have the citations for the things that she is she's using down there. So she's borrowing from um, Michael Lamb's work on ethics of climate change, change communication. And we're looking at three different moral philosophies, consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics, and ways that what they talk about could impact what we're doing for XAI. Um, and so, you know, do you evaluate your actions as morally right or wrong? And, and looking at the emphasis of the actions. And so let's talk briefly. Um, I mostly focus on the deontology because I'm not um, 
That is not my main research area, though I need to dig into it more as we are working on developing these principles. But the deontolo de deontological ethics talk about the fact that honesty is an Im imperative. And honesty is something that we should be looking at, make sure the XAI that we develop is presenting an honest picture of the model. So that first picture I showed you of just the the looking at what the probability match mean of the storm at the different levels isn't really necessarily honest because it was missing some key things that if we took out levels of the storm, which wouldn't happen in reality, you can't just take a piece of a storm out, we're still predicting a high tornado probability. The other four pieces are from deontological um, ethics is precision, audience relevance, um, process transparency, and specification of uncertainty about your conclusions. And these all apply um, to XAI, but it's, it's, they, they provide trade-offs in what we're doing. You know, how precise are we in what we're showing our, um, our, in our XAI? How relevant is it to the audience? Because that really matters when we talk about trust. We need to talk about what the audience cares about. The scientific audience and the forecaster audience and the public audience are three different audiences. And what do they care about and what precision do they need are all very different. So the XAI methods that we're developing need to be tailored to the audience so that they can understand what's going on and trust it, but in a way that matters to them. And the specification of uncertainty also applies to weather and climate. We need to understand how uncertain we are and how the model needs to communicate how uncertain it is. And if we look at virtue ethics, um, and we just know what's truthful, but we're not courageous enough to challenge popular opinion, um, then, then we, don't we do not work on environmental justice. So if we call for ethical AI and XAI, um, we need to talk about whether what the guidelines are for it and how our communication of this is such that so such that virtue, virtue ethics guidelines of being clear in communication and um, giving concrete guidance are satisfied. We need to figure out how to do that. This is a new field that it doesn't really exist. People are just developing methods and they show pictures and typically they show pictures on something like here's a picture of a bird and here's all the new ways that my, my XAI method works on this bird. And we really need to look at it in other domains and other, so um, I think, I know Libby gave a talk. I, I didn't make it to Libby's talk, so I don't know if she's in person or if she was online yesterday, but um, she and Emma eber Rukoff share a postdoc who was talking about how, ways in which you could apply XAI to different um, climate data sets. Um, and, you know, that we need more of this so that we understand exactly what the implications are for climate. So if we think about the XAI and the AI methods that we're doing, but particularly in the XAI, we need to think about it as a form of risk communication. What are the risks of, if we produce a misleading or a wrong result with our XAI? Do our explanations convey sufficiently uncertainties about what it's doing and how trustworthy it is? And we need to consider our consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics to make sure our explanations are morally and ethically right. So that is my, my I think I just hit my 30 minutes like I was supposed to. Um, I, I, my ending slide is just that we as a whole really want to keep working on these changes beyond the scope of AI2ES, we want eventually to create a multi-agency, multi-sector center that involves international partnerships that's working on AI, trustworthy AI for weather and climate, and including ethical and responsible use of it. And I will stop there and take questions. And I think so that I can see all of you, I'm gonna stop sharing slides so that I can see you. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, are there questions? Is there any question on the chat? I didn't even see if the chat was there. Uh, okay, so I think Catherine has a question. Hi, thank you so much for a great talk. To follow up on one of your uh, later points, mm -hmm. I feel like as um, as climate uh, as a climate modeler, I'm very familiar with the adage that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, and I think a lot of us see AI-driven models as kind of another way of being usefully wrong. But I worry that the public hears, you know, oh, we've applied artificial intelligence to this problem, to this prediction, and that it has this sort of polarizing, uh, even more of a polarizing than usual idea of some people are going to think that that's, you know, automatically far, far better and more trustworthy, and some people um, are going to kind of think of Skynet. Um, so how do we sort of, do you think, demystify um, 
the process of using AI in climate models, uh, given kind of current public perception of it? It's an excellent question. Um, and I, I, I don't have an answer. I, I do have an answer partly. I th so part of what we're doing in our trustworthy development um, in, in the Institute is we're doing interviews with end users. Um, and we're trying to actually understand what they think of the AI and the XAI and what it mean, what the explanations mean to them and what it means to be trustworthy and why they might trust the model and why they wouldn't. The reason I say I only have a partial answer is the interviews we're doing are all based on weather, not on climate. That's just at the moment. I mean, you know, we have five years. We're in year two. Um, and and the other the interviews right now we're all doing with scientific end users. But the end goal, I think, is to get to the public because we really need to understand what's different between the scientific end users and the public. And I think that the needs for climate and the needs for, for weather may be slightly different. And part of that, um, I gave a talk a couple weeks ago and one of the points that came, or actually was last week um, at the DOE workshop. And one of the points that came up in the questions, which I think is really critical, is that with, with a weather model, you can sort of immediately show the public the impact in the sense that, well, my model predicted it was going to rain and it rained. So you can like validate it, but it's harder to say, well, my model shows that we're going to warm by four degrees in the next hundred years, right? How do you validate that? Because you have to wait so long and the people are just like, there, there's a whole, there's a different level of trust. Um, and I don't have an answer to that other than to say that I'm really hoping that the, the interviews are going to give us something. Um, I didn't grab the slides from there, but we're doing in-depth interviews of these users is the looking at the different methods and saying, why in the world, what do you trust out of this? What does it tell you? And we're trying to figure out out of that, which is all qualitative research, what we can do to feed that back into our models to make them better. Thank you. I hope that's an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Hi. Oh, go ahead. Um, my name is Deborah. I'm from USCISI. Uh, my question was more about helicopter science, like how you deal with the idea of we go to another country we collect data there, we don't involve scientists from that country, and we use that data to make predictions. Would that fall under trustworthy AI and justice? I don't think it would. I think we need to be working with the scientists locally, and, and, and I think that's actually a really good key point, that if we're going to do predictions in another country, especially a country that has different sensors and different data, we need to work with them and figure out what their needs are and figure out how we can actually develop something. I think that would go under the principles for ethical and responsible AI, in my opinion. So I think the helicopter end would be wrong. Thank you. Duncan. Duncan. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you very much for a thought provoking talk, Amy. Um, I was just wanted to pick up on this example you used of the tornado um, classification as, as kind of dishonest AI almost, and where the line between robustness and you know, expectation maybe and honesty lies because on on first kind of looking at those results, I would I would be quite happy with that, that it's robust against noise and robust against um, missing data. Um, and it's not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I, I wouldn't call it dishonest to say, you know, it, it maybe is extrapolating better than we might expect it to. Um, but maybe you could expand on on, you know, how we how we think about these things. You know, we went back and forth on that. And, and part of it was that, yeah, the, the question of dishonesty is a really good question, right? So I was basing part of that work on a part of it, the idea of the dishonesty based on a paper that came out recently about Clever Hans and how it was learning to predict horse images and the way that it learned to, to, that if a horse was in the image was just there was an HTML tag at the bottom and it was a coincidence right. because that was where they downloaded the data from. Yeah. And, and it, we almost felt like this was the same thing that was happening, is it learned something special inside the image that we didn't know what it was. We have finally narrowed it down better, um, and it had to do with the sensitivity to max pooling, and it had to do with the way he was generating his noise was not completely random noise, despite what showed in that graphic. He actually took the image and then just mixed up the pixels. So he still had the same distribution, and it was learning based on the distribution of the high values of reflectivity which is something that's actually physical because it means the storm has a high, it, it's intense there, right? right? We broke up the physical proximity of those pixels. Um, but he's able to actually, with different kinds of pooling, actually make the results look like we expect them to look, which is that as you add more noise, it goes down. Um, and, and so it, I don't want to spoil his thunder because that's going to be his talk, but, but it, uh, it, I think that 
the honesty level of it is just that I think we too often, we the scientists, look at the first answer on the XAI and say, this is basically a confirmation bias. We looked at this one XAI method. It confirms that the model learned what we expected it to learn. And so now we're just not going to look into it deeper. And the only reason we started looking into it deeper was that Randy, because it, was, it wasn't Randy's project, right? It was Ryan's PhD project. Randy came in to start playing with it. He just started asking new questions. And again, not blaming Ryan. He just started asking new questions. And so I want us to think about that for all of our science. I think we get so entrenched in it that we think, oh, and it's, it's a dishonesty to ourself. We think, oh, we know exactly what's going on in this. It gave us the predictions that we expect. It looks like what I expect when I dig into it a little bit. I'm going to move on. I'm going to trust it. So, I mean, I guess you'd hope the peer review would pick that up, but I think, yeah. Unless yeah, you yeah. tell them, I mean, who would, would you as a peer reviewer have thought to say, what happens if you add random noise to this model? Yeah, 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 fair. I bet you wouldn't because we have a paper on it <laughs> and the peer review <laughs> didn't ask. <laughs> so, I mean, I th would you do this with your climate model? I mean, it gets to the other question, how do we know with our climate model, whether or not there's noise in it that's affecting it 100 years from now? Unless we've really asked the question, which ties into the question of how can we develop things that test for bias, right? I, I brought it up as an example because it's a way to show that things could have gone wrong, but we didn't know it. And we were being, you know, it, we, we, need to, we need to really dig deep so that we really understand everything that's going on. I don't, Keep does that going. answer the question? It, it was an interesting discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Amy, this is Mike Zonova. Thank you for a, a great talk. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about or speak a little bit to the, I guess, the traction that XAI is getting. So, you know, explainability methods that we as a sort of a larger field maybe are taking without really looking at, say, the discussion in the computer science um, community where these things are definitely still being developed. And, and, you know, that there are a lot of open questions there that are being discussed and handled, but not necessarily in a way that's relevant to us as a more physical science. And also in terms of being a more physical science, a slightly different question, whether or not the focus on making explainable models might be a little bit unfortunate in the sense that unlike the social sciences or, you know, doing, doing things like facial recognition, you know, we have the equations and in that sense, I think that there's scope for us to not just try to, you know, do old problems more better by just giving it lots of data, but also engineer our problems and make things more interpretable rather than just explainable. Right. So there are two halves to your question, and both halves are really good. Uh, <laughs> The explainable, and you're summing it up there at the end, the explainable versus interpretable is a debate that's happening in the computer science community right now. Yeah, I know it's great. It's great, yes. It's, it's, it's uh, frustrating, though. In the beginning, like, if you look at the papers as they're coalescing over the last few years, people use these terms kind of interchangeably. But they're starting to, to coalesce into interpretable means something that the humans can look at directly from the model, and explainable is more like a post hoc model that you learn to explain your black box. Yeah. Um, but that isn't the way that they, like, if you go look at the papers from two years ago, that isn't how they're being used. Two years ago, even, they were just being used interchangeably. And, and I think that that, in, that debate um, hasn't yet reached the physical sciences. We're trying to bring it here, which I think was the first half of your question. Um, and I think there are ways in which some of those models can go wrong. If you focus too hard on the interpretation, you might lose some of the physical nature of it. If you focus too hard on the explainability, you're getting some of the things that, like we showed, that you might have confirmation bias. Um, um, I liked Laura's talk on I, – I, it's been a long week. I don't know what day Laura's talk was. Was she Monday or Tuesday? It's been a long week. Um, <laughs> but she was talking about learning the equations. Um, and, and, and using the equations as part of her interpretability, which I think is something that they aren't talking a lot about in the computer science community because they don't learn about, there's no equations to facial recognition, but it's something I think we should do more of here. Um, and something that we're trying to do in our NSF Institute is also develop XAI methods that have the laws of physics embedded in them. And, um, when I say XAI, I mean both interpretable and explainable in this case. Um, we, we wrote it, we wrote it all explainable using the terms interchangeably, but I mean more interpretable, I think, at this point. So not post hoc. I mean both, honestly. We've tried both. Right. If paper ever shows up, we have a BAMS paper that's been under round two of revisions for entirely too long for BAMS. Um, I don't know what's going on with it. It's been there for like 
three months at this point. Um, but it is talking about a way that you can do post hoc with physical laws in there and trying to do uh, put the physical laws into the statistical tests too. Um, but that, but I think that pre the interpretation method version is going to work out better the more that we learn. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I hope that gets published. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Everything's slow. I'm an editor right now. I'm an editor in chief for a brand new journal, by the way, that just started accepting uh, papers this week. So I know how everything is just, everybody in this COVID world is still juggling. So I get it. That wasn't a complaint, by the way. It'll just come out eventually. <laughs> I don't, did that answer all the question? Because I think the question you're asking is open-ended. I don't have an answer that's going to say this is the answer, right? The answer is this is very much an open part of the research and we're all working on it. Yeah, no, exactly. I think it's just, worth I guess mentioning these things to a wider audience here and also yeah I want to get um Cynthia Rudin to come in and give a talk because she's one of the people who's big on talking about the difference between explainable and interpretable and I want to bring her in who is that what who uh you mentioned the name I think oh Cynthia Rudin she's at um oh, yeah 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 and she's big on the explainable versus interpretable and I want to get her to come give a talk on this, because I don't think she does it for weather. I think she's doing it. She's doing it all for CS, and I'd like her yeah, to. She's more social science, I think. We, um, she was at Neurops, I think, or I ICML. Um, okay. We interacted there. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm. I'm giving a talk at Neurops this year, but I'm only. It's all. I don't. Is Neurops virtual? I don't know. My talk is virtual. <laughs> um, I should probably know, but. <laughs> virtual. Okay. Well, then maybe I'll get to interact with her there. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, um, thanks for that. I'm Robert Pincus from um, Columbia, from Lamont Doherty. Um, a, a question that came up for me yesterday during um, Libby's terrific talk um, was how, I, I think this is um, a communication question as much as it is an ethics question. Um, if people are expecting a prediction and you have to acknowledge that there are times that your prediction method fails you, how, how can we communicate that effectively? So I think it's a um, terrific idea that you would be able to say, well, I, I am able to make a, a concrete prediction at this under these circumstances and to, to abstain, to use Lib Libby's terminology, but you're bringing up similar ideas to say, right. this is the limits of my predictability. Um, but then what do you do in circumstances where people are relying on those predictions, how do you communicate that without, and in particular without destroying the trust that people have in your ability to predict? I don't have an answer to that other than to say it's something that we're definitely looking into. Um, it's the thing that we're, it's part of what that last part of the current research, we're trying to figure out what the link between the trust and the communication and the uh, is. Um, and I think that it's really, really critical that the model be able to say, I am not confident in my predictions right now, please don't use them. But it is a really critical question is if the model says that, does that, what does that do to the trust in the humans? So I don't have an answer other than to say that that is very much active research and we're working on. And Libby's part of our group, by the way. Okay, great. Thanks again, Amy. And, and Libby just showed up. Look at that. She showed up on the Zoom. <laughs> you, just you just got a question asked about your talk versus my talk. So you showed up at exactly the right time, Libby. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, I needed three minutes earlier. Good to see you, Amy. You too. I guess you're going to your next speaker. Is your next speaker in person or on Zoom? Uh, in person. And let's thank uh, Amy again. Thank you.